Hi everyone, welcome to this session on Calico Security Policy Best Practices. My name is Adil Abdul Majid. I'm a solutions architect with Tigeras Customer Success Team, helping our customers deploy Calico solutions. Okay, let's start off with the agenda for today's session. We're going to be looking at security challenges in Kubernetes and how Kubernetes disrupts traditional networking and security paradigms. We look at Calico security policies, the anatomy of a Calico security policy, and the declarative policy language. Next, move on to best practices for security policy implementation with some example security policy patterns. I think one of the best ways to understand security policies is to look at some examples and how those examples can be incorporated into your environments and build a security policy model. Once we have the model built, we will then look at how you can introduce policy governance to that policy model. Let's have a brief look at the Kubernetes networking model. The model stipulates that pods can communicate with all of the pods on any other node without the requirement for network address translation. Agents on a node such as system daemons and kubelet can communicate with all pods on that node. And the most common container runtimes use container network interface plugins to manage their networking and security capabilities. Calico being one of the most widely adapted CNI plugins for Kubernetes. So at a high level, the Kubernetes networking model provides for a flat network where pods in the cluster can freely talk to each other. There are benefits to this model. It alleviates the complexities that could have been due to the underlying network. However, the model also introduces certain security challenges. Kubernetes disrupts traditional networking and security paradigms. In traditional networks, when security is enforced, it's done so at certain choke points in the network. And controls are enforced when traffic traverses or transits those choke points, typically using some form of networking construct. Now in Kubernetes, pod scheduling is dynamic, IP addresses are ephemeral, and scheduling is typically non-deterministic. Okay? What that means is you can't bind a workload identity to a networking construct anymore. Also, firewalls external to the cluster cannot map IP addresses to workload identities. So when traffic egresses the cluster, Upstream firewalls cannot enforce security policies based on IP addresses because the IP addresses for a pod are non-deterministic. With those challenges also comes an opportunity and we'll look at Calico a bit in this slide. Calico among certain other functionalities primarily offers the container network interface for Kubernetes, IP address management, and the security policy engine. Now, Calico is quite flexible in the routing modes that it supports, as well as the data plane it supports for policy enforcement. So for routing, you can choose between IP in IP, VXLAN overlay modes, or native BGP. And for the data plane, you can choose between eBPF, IP tables, and Windows HNS if you have Windows nodes in your clusters. Now, the primary benefit of this tight integration with the orchestration plane being that workload identity is tightly coupled to networking and security in a way that was never before possible prior to Kubernetes. And this offers a number of advantages that we will explore in the subsequent slides. All right, moving on, let's look at the characteristics of security policies. Security policies are label-based, and the key value pairs are the primary selectors to scope policies and refer to source and destination endpoints in policies. The policies are declarative, so Calico offers a very flexible declarative policy language. And what that means is that the 
underlying implementation of the policy is abstracted from the user. The underlying implementation being the data planes. For example, eBPF, IP tables, or Windows HNS, that is abstracted from the user. What the user gets is this declarative policy language that can be used to define security intentions. Okay? And policies are highly dynamic. And what that means is the underlying policy implementation in the data plane is for every pod in the cluster. So as pods are created, so are policies. And as pods move, so do the policies. So the policies are highly dynamic. But you as a user, you only have to specify the security intention using the declarative policy language, and Calico will take care of the underlying policy implementation using a data plane of your choosing. Okay, so these are some of the characteristics of security policies. All right, next let's move on to Calico security policy features. Now Calico supports network policy and global network policy. And when I say security policy, I'm referring to both network policy and global network policy. We support policy ordering. Now Calico policies are an extension of Kubernetes policies. However, Calico offers several more extensions than what's available in native Kubernetes policies and policy ordering being one of those. And we'll look at how you could leverage policy ordering when building a policy model. Policies can be applied to any kind of endpoint, being pods, VMs, or hosts external to the cluster. Okay. And policy rules support allow, deny, log, and pass actions. When you're specifying source and destinations in a policy rule, there are a number of match criteria. For example, you can match a port, and this could be based on port numbers, range of ports, or even named ports in Kubernetes. You can specify a protocol such as TCP, UDP, ICMP, for example, HTTP attributes, ICMP attributes, IP versions, IPs, CIDRs, network sets, and global network sets. We'll explore some of these in some of the subsequent slides. Endpoint selectors, and this is where you'd use label expressions to select pods, VMs, or other host interfaces. Namespace selectors, or service account selectors. Okay. Now, policies also support optional packet handling capabilities such as disable connection tracking, apply before NAT, apply to forward traffic, etc. And, and these primarily apply to host endpoint policies. Now, there's a lot going on in this slide, and it's not possible to cover all the policy features in a single session. So in this session, we're going to focus on policies for pods and containers. All right? We're not going to be discussing about policies for host endpoints or VMs or policies for or nodes outside the cluster. And in terms of actions, we're primarily going to be focusing on the allow and deny action. We're also not going to be discussing about the optional packet handling capabilities. Now I'll link the docs site and the best place to learn about policies and all that it's capable of is the Project Calico docs site. Okay, so there's a link to that down below. Okay, so let's have a look at the anatomy of a Calico security policy. So a security policy has a scope. It could either be a namespace scope policy, which applies to a specific namespace, or a global network policy, which could apply to multiple namespaces, or even all the workload endpoints in the cluster. Now, there are a few selector options. You could use endpoint labels to select specific workload endpoints. If it's a global network policy, you can also use namespace selector to limit that global network policy to specific namespaces. You could also use service accounts as selectors. Now, a policy is going to have one or more ingress and or egress rules. And if you look at a particular rule, in a rule you could have either an allow, deny, log, or pass action. And 
in egress rule, if you look at the destination, there's a two field there where you could specify the destination and the destination protocol. There's also a from field there that you can use to specify the source. Now, when specifying the source, again, you can use endpoint selectors or namespace selectors, service accounts, could be networks, network sets or global network sets. Now, network sets and global network sets are a way of grouping either IP addresses or CIDR blocks, and we'll explore some examples in the subsequent slides. When it comes to protocols, again, we looked at some protocols in the previous slide. For example, you could choose between TCP, UDP, ICMP, even HTTP match, uh, if you're using layer seven policies. All right, so uh, quite a bit going on here, right? Just park this for the moment. I think we'll be able to bring this together when we look at the examples in the subsequent slide. But the idea being that there's a lot of flexibility within a policy. And understanding some policy patterns is the best way you could approach implementing a secure policy model for your environments. Okay. Alrighty. So before we look at some examples, let's look at security policy behavior. Now, if no network policies or global network policies for that matter are applied to a pod, then all traffic to and from that pod is allowed. So by default, if a network policy is not applied to a workload, all traffic is allowed. That's the that's default whitelist behavior in Kubernetes. Now, if one or more network policies apply to a pod containing ingress rules, then only ingress rules or ingress traffic rather specifically allowed by those policies is allowed for those endpoints. If one or more network policies apply to a pod containing egress rules, then only egress traffic specifically allowed by those policies is allowed for those endpoints. What this simply means is that once an endpoint is matched by a policy, only flows allowed by that policy or any other subsequent policy is allowed for that endpoint. So once you've matched a policy or rather matched an endpoint in a policy, there's a default deny behavior for those endpoints, okay? All right, best practices for security policy implementation. So you should look at grouping all the rules that apply to a given workload or a group of workload into a single policy instead of having multiple security policies. So inside the policy, you can have one or more either ingress and or egress rules. And you should look at using rules for a given workload or a group of workload and making sure that you have a single policy for those workloads with multiple rules, okay? Implement a hierarchical design that allows for optimizing the number of security policies by filtering out non-compliant flows at the top of the funnel. When we look at the policy model in subsequent slides, you will look at how, for example, global network policies are used to implement certain high-level controls so that we can filter out unwanted or non-compliant flows at the top of the funnel. Use global network policies to implement high-level guardrails and network policies to implement fine-grade controls, okay? So global network policies are what spans across multiple namespaces or even all the workloads in the cluster. So you could use global network policies to enforce high-level security intentions and network policies for fine-grained controls that apply to very specific workloads. Leverage policy order with allow and deny actions when developing security policies, right? This is a powerful capability in Calico policies. Also use network sets and global network sets to group IPs and CIDRs so that they could be referenced by even multiple policies, okay? It's just a bit more efficient doing it that way. Right? So with these best practices in mind, 
let's look at some example security policy patterns now the cluster shown here will be used as an example to demonstrate certain security policy patterns this particular cluster has two tenants and a tenant is simply a logical isolation so it could be any form of logical isolation for example in your environment it could be a pci environment that you'd like to isolate from the rest of the cluster workloads if you're a hosting provider a tenant could be a customer so if you have multiple customers you have to make sure that they remain isolated in a shared cluster also if you're having a shared cluster that's shared between various development teams you may want to have a logical isolation all right so a tenant is any form of logical isolation that you'd like to create for your cluster now a tenant could have one or more namespaces so for example in this cluster tenant one has two namespaces hipster shop and yao bank and tenant two has a single namespace called book info okay now the applications in these tenants are exposed using an ingress controller in the ingress nginx namespace right so hopefully this cluster is similar to your environment of course you could horizontally scale you can have more tenants more namespaces but the pattern hopefully is similar to your environments okay all right so now let's look at some example policies before we implement policies i'm kind of assuming this is a live production cluster so i don't want to break anything and that's why i've started off with a default allow here and the default allow is simply a policy that allows all traffic now remember in kubernetes by default kubernetes has a whitelist behavior however once you've matched pods in a policy there is a default deny behavior okay an implicit deny behavior now I'm using this default allow as a fail safe so that I don't impact any live production traffic in this cluster okay so my first policy is a deny list policy and the deny list policy is a calico global network policies which applies to all cluster endpoints more the reason for that default allow so now I have a policy that applies to all cluster endpoints. What that means is all cluster endpoints now have a default deny behavior for egress traffic since this policy matches egress traffic. Okay. So this policy has egress, an egress rule which denies traffic two IPs and siders in the IP deny list global network set and I've shown the global network set on the right hand side as well now recall that global network sets are a way of organizing could be IPs or cider blocks and referencing those in policies now the selector field is used in the egress rule to match the global network set based on the GNS equals IP deny list label so if you look at the global network set we have a gns equals ip deny list label which is referenced in the egress rule implemented in the security policy so there's also a namespace selector in the security policy um, and the namespace selector uses uh, a global match criteria and that's because this particular network set is a global network set okay so what this policy does is if any of the cluster workloads try to connect to the IP addresses specified in this global network set, those flows are going to be denied by this policy. So for example, if you could retrieve these IPs from a thread feed and update, up and, up and update the global network set, then you could effectively deny all cluster workloads access to those malicious IP addresses okay now if you look at the actual underlying policy implementation the policy is implemented for every endpoint in the cluster using the data plane okay however for simplicity i've grouped all the endpoints 
and shown that traffic is denied to the IP deny list global network set. Okay. All right. So this is the first example. Let's move on. The second example is the cube DNS policy. Now the cube DNS policy is a global network policy which applies to all cluster endpoints. It has an ingress rule which allows DNS traffic from all endpoints to cube DNS. Has an egress rule which allows DNS traffic from all endpoints to cube DNS. The selector field is used to match the cube DNS endpoints using the K8's app equals cube DNS label. The namespace selector field is used to select all cluster endpoints using the all match operator. Okay. So if you look at this policy, this is a global network policy. And in the ingress direction, the destination is cube DNS. And we've allowed UDP port 53. So the protocol is UDP. If you were to kind of visualize this policy, you have the cube DNS endpoints and you have we've created this pinhole on the ingress direction from all cluster endpoints to cube DNS. So we've matched all cluster endpoints by using the namespace selector with the all match operator. Now on the egress direction, the source of the egress rule again is all cluster endpoints and the destination again is cube DNS on port 53. So on the egress direction for all cluster endpoints, we've created this pinhole permitting traffic if it's destined to cube DNS on port 53 on UDP port 53. Again, recall that the pinhole is in fact created for all endpoints in the cluster. However, for simplicity, I've grouped those endpoints and shown a single pinhole. So this is the kind of visual representation of this policy. If you'd like to kind of visualize what the policy looks like, and this would be it. And this policy is quite powerful, isn't it? Um, you now have a single declarative policy that's protecting all DNS traffic in the cluster. So you may have thousands of pods and thousands of DNS flows in the cluster that are now protected by this single policy. Okay, let's look at the next policy. This policy is called tenant one restrict. So this is the Calico global network policy which applies to all cluster endpoints in tenant one. The namespace selector field is used in the security policy with the project calico.org forward slash name label to select endpoints in the tenant one namespaces. Has an ingress rule which denies all traffic except from the specified namespaces. Has an egress rule which denies traffic except to the specified namespaces. And the not selector field is used in ingress and egress rules with the project calico.org forward slash namespace label to exempt endpoints that should not be denied. Okay, so this is a global network policy and in the policy and in the policy the namespace selector is used to specify the hipster shop and Yao Bank namespaces. So this policy applies to the hipster shop and Yao Bank endpoints. In the ingress direction, there's a deny action. However, the not selector is used to exempt the endpoints that should not be denied. Similarly, in the egress direction, the action is a deny. Again, the not selector is used to exempt endpoints that should not be denied. Now, the project calico.org label is a label that can be used to identify namespaces and endpoints in those namespaces. Now the value of the label is the name of the namespace. So you could use the project calico.org forward slash name key with the value of the namespace and calico will then select all the endpoints inside that namespace to scope the policy. 
for the rule. Okay. Now the project .org name label is something that can be used to specify or select endpoints. It's a label that Calico associates with an endpoint and the value of the label is the name of the namespace that endpoint belongs to. Okay. So since we're using a not operator, we're using the project Calico dot org forward slash namespace label and we're providing the name of the namespace so that those endpoints are exempted from the security policy. Now if you want to visualize this policy we have the tenant one endpoints selected using the namespace selector so basically endpoints in hipster shop and yao bank all traffic to other endpoints are denied except for what's exempted using the not selector so this policy does not permit any traffic right given that you've specified a policy for tenant one restrict a subsequent policy must permit traffic flows that should be permitted for tenant one workloads okay all this policy does is it isolates the tenant one workloads and denies traffic to all other cluster endpoints except for what's exempted using the not selectors in the rule. Now we're going to have a similar policy for tenant two as well. Again, a global network policy using the namespace selector with projectcalico.org forward slash name label to select the tenant two endpoints has ingress and egress rules again with not selectors using the project calico.org forward slash namespace label to exempt endpoints that should not be denied so similar to the previous rule you know the book info and the ingress eng nginx namespaces are exempted now of course we're exempting the ingress nginx namespace even in the previous case because the applications are exposed via that namespace okay so we'd expect to receive inbound traffic from that namespace again we are not permitting that traffic and when you look at subsequent policies you will see how traffic from ingress nginx is permitted to workloads that are exposed to external consumers okay however with this policy what we've done is similar to the previous policy isolated tenant two endpoints from the rest of the cluster okay so the two restrict policies you know with the two restrict policies you've created a certain level of isolation it's a high level guardrail demarcating those workloads from the rest of the cluster workloads okay all right so now we have a policy called the front end policy now the front end policy is a network policy which applies to the front end endpoints in the hipster shop namespace in tenant one. Now the selector field is used to select the front end endpoints using the app equals front end label, has an ingress rule which permits traffic from the ingress controller. The namespace selector field is used in the rule with the project calico.org forward slash name label to select the ingress nginx namespace. And the selector field is used with multiple labels to select the ingress controller. Egress rules with the selector field matching app equals X, meaning we've got multiple labels being matched. To select other endpoints in the same namespace that the front end endpoint endpoints communicate to. Okay. So let's go through this policy a bit. This is a network policy, which means it applies to a specific namespace the namespace being the hipster shop namespace however in the policy we are using an endpoint selector so we're using the selector field and using the app equals front end label what this means is that the policy applies only to the front end endpoints okay in the ingress direction, you know, we're using a namespace selector to select the ingress nginx namespace. However, we're also using 
endpoint selector. So we're using the selector field and using an and operator specifying a couple of labels to match the ingress controller. Okay. So when you're using selectors and when you're using labels, you could use and or not operators. In this case, we're using an and operator to make sure that the controller has two labels. And that's how we are identifying the ingress controller for in this particular rule okay now in the egress direction front end is sending traffic to add service service uh, specified a port here similarly sending traffic to checkout service now this rule continues i've truncated the rule what's important is not the number of services it's talking to in the same namespace there's quite a bit of them for this particular application but the idea being that the pattern is is the same it kind of repeats and what we're doing is given that this policy applies to the hipster shop namespace we're using the selector field to select other workloads that the front end workload can communicate with in the same namespace now bear in mind that just because traffic is permitted from the front end workload doesn't mean that we've allowed end to end communication. Okay. So if you had to visualize this policy, you know, we have the front end endpoints, and in the ingress direction, we've created a pinhole so that the front end endpoints can receive traffic from ingress nginx. And on the egress direction, we've created a pinhole so that the front end endpoints can send traffic to other services in the same namespace. However, for those services, and we'll look at this in a subsequent policy, you also have to make sure that you create an ingress pinhole for those endpoints, okay, which we've not done yet. So just because there's an egress rule permitting traffic from front end to check out service, it doesn't mean that the rule or the flow rather is allowed end to end all right so now let's move on to the checkout service policy again this is a network policy which applies to the checkout service endpoints in the hipster shop namespace the selector field is used in the security policy to select checkout services endpoints using the app equals checkout service label has an ingress rule with the selector field to select the front end endpoints using the app equals front end label and several egress rules with the selector field matching app, app equals x labels to select other endpoints in the same namespace that checkout service endpoints would need to communicate with. All right, so in this example, the policy is a network policy very similar to the policy we saw for the front end service however if you look at the ingress rule we are simply permitting the front end service to talk to the checkout service so there's a pinhole now created in the ingress direction for the checkout services endpoints however if you recall the previous policy the egress pinhole for the front end endpoints were created in the front end policy okay so now with this policy, we now have end-to-end -end communication or the end-to-end -end flow from the front end to checkout permitted, okay? And the checkout service endpoint has an egress rule, so a pinhole in the egress direction for the checkout services endpoint to permitting it or allowing it to communicate with the other endpoints in the same namespace that it should be able to communicate with, okay? Again, the same logic holds, right? So for example, if it's communicating with payment services, in the policy that we have for payment services, we've got to make sure that that flow is allowed in the inbound direction, okay? So the policies we're developing for the hipster shop namespace are very fine-grained granular policies, right? The policies apply to select endpoints endpoints representing a particular microservice and for those endpoints we are applying rules in both the inbound and the outbound directions right so these are very granular policies okay now of course 
for the checkout service, we're not permitting traffic from the ingress because it's the front end that communicates or the front end that receives traffic from the ingress. Okay. However, the checkout service will receive traffic from front end and on the egress direction communicate with other microservices or endpoints in the same namespace. All right, so let's move forward. So I've not shown the rest of the policies for the hipster shop namespace. Those policies, you know, will continue. However, the pattern remains the same. Okay. So assuming that we've completed the policies for the hipster shop namespace, let's now look at the policy for the Yao Bank namespace. This policy is a network policy which applies to all endpoints in the Yao Bank namespace has an ingress rule which permits traffic from the ingress controller. The namespace selector field is used in the rule with the project calico.org name label to select the ingress nginx namespace. And the selector field is used with multiple labels to select the ingress controller. Traffic permitted to the customer endpoints using a selector with label equals app equals customer label. Now the policy also has an ingress rule which permits traffic from all other endpoints in the same namespace using the selector field with the all match operator. Similarly, it also has an egress rule which permits traffic to all endpoints in the same namespace using the selector field with the all match operator. So this is a interesting pattern. So very similar to the front end policy we looked at, however, with a distinction. So this is a network policy applies to the Yao Bank namespace. And in the ingress direction, if you look at the rule, given that this policy applies to all endpoints in the Yao Bank namespace, we've not specified a selector. And what that means is all endpoints in the namespace are matched for this policy. If you look at the ingress rule, very similar to some of the ingress rules we looked at previously, we are using the namespace selector and the endpoint selector to select the Nginx ingress controller. However, this particular rule also has a destination field that's used and the destination for the ingress rule is the customer endpoints. Okay. If you look at the second ingress rule, what this means is that all endpoints in the Yao Bank namespace can receive traffic from all other endpoints in the Yao Bank namespace. Given that this is a network policy and we've not specified selectors, all endpoints can receive traffic from all other endpoints. And the egress rule is similar to that as well. There are no selectors. And what this means is that all endpoints can send traffic to all other endpoints in the Yao Bank namespace. So this is what the pattern looks like. The ingress nginx can send traffic to the customer endpoints. That's governed by the first rule in the ingress direction. However, the endpoints within the namespace can freely talk to each other since we've permitted or allowed outbound and inbound communications from all endpoints in the same namespace. So this is what this pattern looks like. Now this is a bit of a coarse grained policy. At times you may want to implement such policies, right? If you trust all the workloads inside the namespace, if it's a namespace that is not too critical, however, has several workloads, you can create a guardrail around the namespace rather than for every group of endpoints inside the namespace. Now this differs from the policy we created for you know front end and checkout and the services in the hipster shop namespace because those policies were very specific to a group of endpoints within the same namespace and even when they had to communicate with other endpoints in the same namespace it had to be explicitly permitted using rules or policies. All right, so moving on to the book info policy, very similar to the Yao Bank. It's a very similar pattern. Again, traffic from the ingress is permitted 
this time to the product page deployment, which is exposed to external consumers, and all communications inside the namespace to and from all the endpoints inside the namespace is allowed. Okay, so very similar pattern to what was seen in the Yao Bank policy. So it's not important that you kind of understand all the microservices involved in some of these examples. The idea is that you understand the pattern, right? So in, in the Yao Bank example, it was the customer endpoint that was exposed to external consumers. And in the booking, for example, it's the product page endpoints that's exposed to external consumers. And those are the endpoints that have the pinhole in the ingress direction, permitting traffic from the ingress controller. All right, so we've looked at a few policy patterns, right? So we started off with the deny list. We had a pattern for kubedns, build policies to restrict tenant one and tenant two workloads. We looked at some granular policies for the endpoints in the hips shop namespace, and then look at some coarse grain policies for Yao Bank and Book Info. Now, once you're done building policies for a certain set of namespaces, you could then enforce a default deny for those namespaces. So in this case, we are first enforcing a default deny for tenant one. And what this says is that deny all traffic in the ingress and egress directions for the tenant one workloads. This policy is a global network policies and the workloads are identified using the namespace selector. In this case, we've matched the hipster shop and Yao Bank namespaces. Similarly, we have a tenant two default deny, very similar logic. It's a global network policy. We've matched the namespaces using a namespace select. In this case, it's just a booking for namespace and all ingress and egress traffic is denied. All right, so hopefully now you understand the reason for this default deny, right? Sorry, default allow. If you look at this policy model, I have policies where we've matched all the endpoints in the cluster, for example, cube DNS. However, we've not built all the policies for all the endpoints in the cluster, right? Um, and what this means is that if that default deny, sorry, the default allow wasn't there, right? I would be denying all other flows in the cluster. So the idea being that you take a progressive approach when developing your policy model, you may want to restrict certain environments so in this case assuming that tenant one the tenants were actually customers you'd want to secure those custom environments and isolate them from the rest of the cluster so that's what we've done and now you can continue with the rest of the policy development however hopefully the patterns that we've shown with the global network policies the network policies and how environments were isolated from the rest of the cluster the coarse grain policies and the fine grain policies. Hopefully those patterns help you think about how you should be approaching policies for your environments. All right, so with the policy model built, now you're in a position, you know, to introduce security policy governance, okay? And when you're thinking about governance, you know, you've got to think in terms of a policy model rather than individual policies and leverage security policy ordering, role-based access control, and admission control to enforce policy governance, okay? For example, if application developers are authoring policies, and if they're authoring policies for a particular namespace, you could, for example, assign a certain order for the policies that they are allowed to author, okay? That kind of ensures that they're not able to circumvent high-level controls that you have enforced. So for example, controls such as the restrict and the deny list may be under the purview of the security team. And when you are permitting other authors to apply policies, you may want to have some governance around that. And policy ordering is a feature that you could use to create a governance structure. Okay. Now, of course, policies are Kubernetes resources and as such are subject to Kubernetes are back again when allowing other authors to apply policies. Uh, 
you could control which authors can apply policies to which namespaces using RBAC. Of course, tie all of these together with admission control. Alrighty, so there's a lot going on in a Calico policy. And I think we've simply scratched the surface here. The best place to understand all the features, all the capabilities, all the fields and operators available in a Calico policy is to refer to the documentation. I've put the link here to the network policy and the global network policy documentation for Project Calico. All right. So with that, you know, let's talk a bit about Calico Enterprise and Calico Cloud. Calico OSS is the foundation for Calico Enterprise and Calico Cloud. We look at the policy features in Calico OSS and Calico Enterprise and Cloud builds on top of this and offers certain advanced security policy features. For example, you could use policy tiering. So when we build policies this time, the policy model was in a single tier with Calico Enterprise and Cloud. You have the option to have multiple policy tiers. There's a policy UI editor a policy recommender to suggest policies based on active flows in the cluster, policy dashboards with Prometheus metrics, policy auditing, login capabilities, and endpoint browser to identify which policies are applied to certain endpoints, service graph to identify and understand security policy evaluation, flow visualization for troubleshooting and compliance reporting. So add-on functionality, however, the functionality provided by Calico OSS remains the foundation for these additional capabilities. All right, with that, uh, I think we're going to wrap this session. Again, thanks for your time. I hope it was beneficial. For more information, you can find us on the Project Calico Slack channel and also the Project Calico documentation for further information around some of the policies uh, and the policy features that we discussed in this session. Uh, with that, thanks for watching. Um, I hope you have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Bye.